So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whichever is the case, since we are um, uh, streaming a live and we are having this uh, webinar um, in different time zones uh, with people coming, of course, from all over the world. So my name is Clara Saraiva. I'm, um, I'm in the board and the organizing committee of WCA, the World Council of Anthropological Associations. And um, this webinar comes in a series of webinars that WCA has been organizing. Uh, the first one took place in May, the sec uh, sorry, in April, the second one in May, and this is the third one now in June. So WCA, the World Council of Anthropological Associations, as you know, uh, is part of WOW, which is the World Anthropological Union, together with IUAES, the International Union, Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. So, uh, with the theme of inequalities, inequalities in an era of pandemia, we gathered several uh, colleagues um, from different countries. We will have from the Philippines, Mary Rasselis from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. From India, Nandini Sundar from the Delhi School of Economics, Delhi University. From Russia, Valery Tishkov, I'm hoping I'm saying it correctly, from the Russian State University for the Humanities and the Russian Academy of Sciences. From South Africa, Divine Fu, from the Institute for the Humanities in Africa, University of Cape Town. From Argentina, Mariano Perelman, Instituto de Investigación Gino Germani, Universidad de Buenos Aires. And from Canada, Janice Graham from Dalhuis University. So these are all our fellow colleagues, anthropologists, who have somehow, uh, in different ways, worked on the theme of inequalities. Um, and and yeah. Hi, uh, I'm really happy to be part of this. Um, and I think what we've all been going through is a period of increasing inequality. If you look at Piketty, uh, both globally and in particular for India, um, you know, since the 1980s uh, till now, income inequality has been rising, going back to the levels of the 1920s, uh, where you have, you know, the top 0.1% getting more than, um, more share of the growth than the bottom 50%. Uh, so, you know, that entire period post from about the 50s to the 80s, um, where you had nationalization of industries, some form of socialism um, has given way since the early 90s to some forms of neoliberalism. And the pandemic, I think, has simply sort of brought out quite starkly the kinds of precarities and uh, inequalities that already existed um, and intensified them um, in a variety of new ways. So, for instance, in India, one of the biggest aspects of inequality has been um, migrant workers who've been stranded by the stringent lockdown. They were only given four hours notice, walking thousands of kilometers home um, to their villages, uh, you know, because they were out of work, they had no money for rents, um, they had no food. And so on the one hand, you have this very clear precarity. You have the idea that it's really the village which is what they consider home, which is something that was came as a surprise to a lot of people because there's been so much discussion of urbanization being the new norm and how everybody's, you know, actually an urban aspirant. Um, and the third thing that's really been striking is, is the kind of indifference of the middle classes. I mean, there've been lots of people who've helped, but at the top levels of government, the kind of callousness and indifference has been quite shocking. So I'm just going to stop there, I think. Um, my time is up. Okay. All right. So, um, Valerie Tishov, Tishkov, sorry, from the Russian Academy yeah. of Sciences. Okay. So, I'm going to speak more about uh, equality than uh, than inequality because uh, they, uh, because we have a, a, a certain backgrounds uh, inherited from the previous state, the USSR, which was quite egalitarian. Uh, social state and it's still now we have a situation where no citizens without medical insurance and medical assistance uh, provided for all country residents including uh, by the way migrants I just today checked uh, spoke to some of the labor migrants from Uzbek from Tajikistan and they proved this uh, information 
And also the post soil structure was characterized by uh, uh, by a tiny sector of so-called new Russians or Novarish people, it's less than one percent, and and the pretty sizable about five five seven percent labor migrants, uh, and the rest of population is just uh, more or less relatively well doing uh, big cities residents. Uh, and uh, rural, rural area inhabitants. Uh, what is uh, interesting for Russia that there is no poverty, urban zones, or, uh, or also uh, depression regions. Uh, regional socioeconomic disparities exist, especially favoring Moscow and Saint Petersburg, and some also resource. Uh, Siberian uh, regions with gas and oil activities, and also um, uh, South, uh, South Russia, excluding, uh, excluding the North Caucasus republics. And also when I speak about Siberia, I would exclude also indigenous population settlements, which are not so successful and well doing. The coronavirus dynamics, uh, we are the, the third uh, in the number of effective, uh, infective people. It's, uh, uh, 600,000 million people uh, were infected. Uh, the dead uh, rate, mortality rate is over 8,000 people. And uh, one third uh, of infected people are in Moscow. And, uh, and the dynamic is also characterized that uh, we had a certain time, uh, uh, time lag because two months after China, it's touched uh, the country, and mainly because of the Russian tourist students, business people returning from uh, mainly from Europe. And uh, the this epicenter of uh, of uh, pandemic wasn't still Moscow. It's about one third of uh, infected, and also one quarter of people who uh, passed away. And uh, Societal responses are quite interesting. We did uh, a, a lot of sociological surveys. I have it in my presentation, and no time to uh, to report of this. But there are regional and ethnic aspects uh, concerning the societal responses. Uh, pandemia statistic is available by, by regions and by days, and it's more or less reliable. And uh, I couldn't actually to establish any correlation between uh, the uh, ethnicity and religious. Uh, for example, the Volga regions, where we have uh, regions or republics or uh, federal units with mixed population, predominantly ethnic Russians or non-Russian people, and, uh, and the data is more or less uh, uh, the same concerning the promille percentage if we'll take mortality da data. Critical situation took place in four or five places, uh, including uh, actually the ethnic, uh, ethnically mixed uh, uh, and very unique uh, territory of Republic of Dagestan and the mountain area in the Northern Caucasus. Uh, peculiarities concerning the Russia, which, which we're working toward the uh, egalitarian type of, uh, of uh, pandemic character. That is the so-called the Dacia phenomena because about 17, 20 millions of land plots which uh, uh, are in possession of the uh, urban dwellers in, in Russia. And people uh, had a chance to spend the summer, uh, spring time uh, there. And it was psychologically, it was more easy and also probably it also facilitated uh, it minimized the level of uh, personal contacts and infections and also probably a huge and sparsely populated territory with communication infrastructure contributed efforts and measures to minimize direct human uh, uh, contacts uh, and what is also it's uh, traditional for Russian people, irrespective of, of ethnicity and religions, a kind of negligence to personal health conditions and a kind of fatalistic attitude toward uh, life scenarios, scenarios worked against antivirus measures. But, uh, but in some, mainly the people were 
uh, behave pretty loyal, loyal, uh, and uh, they they demonstrated uh, capability to follow uh, issued orders and restrictions without any riots uh, and mass demonstrations. And uh, any predictions there would be a rise of uh, uh, criminality, especially among the migrants, people uh, found to be wrong. And uh, uh, volunteers were quite active. And especially what I would say, that is the, uh, uh, the effective of the medical system. Uh, we had a kind of very devoted and professionally quite strong uh, uh, medical uh, hospitals. And the number of beds uh, for infection uh, uh, patients were increased uh, from 40,000 to 220,000 beds. And also military uh, and emergency state uh, agency were help, helpful and also built uh, uh, about a dozen of new hospitals. And uh, that's probably one of the reasons why the level of mortality was uh, pretty low, lo much lower than among other countries which were very strongly affected. What I would say that uh, the crisis made uh, our societies more concerned about strong and legitimate state, a kind of softening uh, between democracies and authoritarian, authoritarian type of governance, and favoring paternalistic modes of governance. The crisis demonstrates, demonstrates the need in strong, devoted, and mobilized, mobilized medical and expert community and the system of issuing and executing public orders and restrictions. And what is important also, I need in culture of listening experts, because the so, to, so corona dissidents were about uh, 15, 15, not more than 20 percent in the country. Others perceived and and uh, and uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, understood the situation uh, the, uh, as a, as a serious crisis. What I would say that uh, people feel a failed international organization and the nation state with a strong governance uh, looks like a key factor for, to confront the epidemic uh, crisis and prevailing. Uh, I would say it's that social strata, religion, and ethnicity were secondary compared with accidental factors and malfunctioning uh, governance. Uh, Dagestan happened not because of the Islamic tradition of mass gatherings for funerals or weddings. Actually, it was uh, contributed, but not was 100% only one uh, uh, reason. The, the reason was a lack of discipline, uh, and ineffective uh, governance, and also low uh, diminished status of medical service in Dagestan, especially in mountain regions. And uh, prevailing popular attitudes toward existential challenges, as well as a state of individual responsibilities, health are probably the only established uh, uh, by my analysis cultural factors that are which affected dynamic of COVID-19 epidemic, individual responsibilities for health, and probably it's, it's, it's a lack of this individual responsibility, one of the characteristics for us. Crisis strengthened phobia against migrants, against travel abroad, suspicion for mass gatherings, and cultural traditions. And I think we should uh, uh, analyze it uh, when uh, the whole data about uh, pandemic would be available to us. Thank you very much. So since Mary is not there, we'll keep following the east-west orientation. So now we will have our colleague from South Africa, Divine Fu, from the Institute for the Humanities in Africa, University of Cape Town. Yes, Hello. you're muted. Hello. Okay, I'll turn my micro off so that you have the word. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you for the opportunity of uh, speaking and uh, good afternoon to everyone. I should start by with a caveat by saying that I'm not an expert on inequality uh, and uh, neither am I an expert on the COVID-19. Uh, I, I, I'm just a, a commentator 
you, you know, on these issues. And I hope that what I contribute to take will be taken with a pinch of uh, salt. Um, so, uh, so I'm living in South Africa, but I'm a Cameroonian. So uh, I guess we, uh, in a way, we have to speak about this country and also about uh, the continent. Uh, I mean, generally, uh, the continent at a time when uh, everyone was having very high infections had contributed to global infections uh, about 1% or less, you know, uh, which, which is a feat given uh, the story of pandemics, you know, on this continent and given all the predictions that we were going to uh, have a pandemic of biblical, you know, proportions, uh, which we really hasn't happened and we are still waiting you know, to uh, see uh, happen. But uh, South Africa has really taken leadership, uh, also partly because South Africa is currently holding the chair of the African Union with uh, um, uh, 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 the South African uh, uh, president. Uh, but uh, uh, right now, uh, South Africa accounts for one of the highest infections across uh, the continent, uh, uh, 1.4 million tests conducted about 110 or 111,000 uh, confirmed infections, about 56,000 recoveries, and uh, about uh, 2,000 deaths or so, uh, which, you know, for a country uh, that has injustice as a kind of a historical wrong or inequality as a historical injustice, uh, it's, it's quite painful. Uh, we know that uh, South Africa itself as a state was created to be an unequal space, you know. It is structured in the DNA of this country, right from the Union State, of, uh, right up to apartheid, and the ways in which the country itself is founded on dispossession. And that's the history of much of this continent, uh, whether you talk about Cameroon, whether you talk about Nigeria, uh, the colonial state itself was founded on dispossession and at the same time explo uh, exploited labor. Uh, and I think what we have learned from COVID is that COVID thrives on uh, pre-existing conditions, you know. It, th it thrives on pre-existing conditions on the bodies. It, it thrives on pre-existing conditions, you know, in, in specific uh, uh, structures. So uh, South Africa is ranked as one of the most unequal societies in the world, you know. Uh, this is a huge challenge, you know, for uh, this government and every day and uh, the government, civil society and individuals try their best to see how to uh, level this. And you can see what this has done uh, because it then creates a fertile ground uh, for pandemics. We saw with HIV that uh, it was actually the poorest of the poor who suffered uh, most. We are seeing now with... Uh, 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 COVID-19, that it is uh, the people who are located, you know, in, in these very poor and disadvantaged communities who also provide care level and who do care work and the reproductive work who are actually more uh, infected, uh, you know, by uh, the virus and so on. Uh, but uh, once you say that the South African state has actually uh, uh, really invest invested much. We have the toughest lockdown. We have experienced the toughest lockdown on the continent. One of the toughest lockdowns in the world uh, uh, so far. Uh, we are beginning to ease uh, a lockdown in phases. We are now in uh, level three of the lockdown. Uh, and I think by the end of um, this month, will be slowly moving back, you know, into uh, the economy. But what we're experiencing uh, is that it is thriving on an in inequality that has structured the society, you know, for, for many years. Uh, it's not a surprise that Piketty starts his book, you know, Inequality in the 21st Century with South Africa as an example, you know, with Marikana, uh, you know, and the kinds of inequalities that led to that uh, uh, violence uh, uh, also. I, I would end there for now. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Divine, uh, for your intervention. Uh, we will now move on to Argentina, Mariano Perelman, Instituto de Investigaciones Gino Germani, Universidad de Buenos Aires. Jean, uh, Mariano. I am also a researcher of the Argentinian National Council, CONICET. Um, 
thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and when I got these questions, I, I start thinking and I realized how difficult it is to talk about inequalities. Um, we are doing well in Argentina because uh, epidemiologically way of speaking, we are doing well. We have uh, 50,000 confirmed cases and 1,000 dead only. Uh, so compared with Brazil, our neighbors, that has the same numbers, but per day. So uh, in that thing, yes, we have a, a very also hard um, isolation. We are here isolated uh, for 90 days. I'm at home, I cannot go out home, uh, only to buy food and that stuff. So it is being, being hard. Um, and I said that this, uh, I, the complexity of thinking about inequalities is, is because we may agree that uh, there are many dimensions of inequality, inequalities. Um, so, and there are some opposed tendencies also to think about inequalities. So it is hard to, to say and to characterize Argentinian case. I start thinking about these proportions and what I start thinking it's about how there is a myth here about Argentina being an European country. And as a myth, it's not real or false. It has its effects. Uh, and this goes with, a, with an interesting thing about inequalities is the denial of, for instance, native uh, people here, uh, black people, black skinned people. Um, uh, the history of, uh, of these people is denied. Uh, the way of their living is denied, uh, denied. So that's one core interesting in, of inequalities here. It says that Argentinians came from the boat. No, that's the idea. Um, there are uh, some inequalities produced uh, from this racism. And also there is a uh, structural interesting differentiation between the center, Buenos Aires city, and the interior of the country. So there is Buenos Aires and the rest of the city. Uh, this is uh, the inequality of wealth, but also uh, uh, the, way, the way of uh, different ways of living are uh, evaluated, evaluated. So for instance, the, in the interior, we are called the, the people, the negros, the black, that this is not a, a thing of skin color, but it's um, a, a way of saying that this construction difference between the civilization and the rest of the city. Um, so also the gender uh, issue, it's important here as in, in all countries and uh, urban inequalities that are what I deal with. Um, so how this was, I'm, I'm getting out of time. I'm nervous because of that. <laughs> uh, and um, how pandemic works within these inequalities, it is interesting to understand for, uh, as, as it's, it's uh, I love this idea because it's showing that there is no one pandemic, but there are many pandemics here or how we can construct the idea of pandemic. Uh, not only as a global, but also as a regional and local thing. What I'm trying to say is that we should, we can understand the um, pandemic effects or the pandemic uh, by thinking about this, uh, what, what, uh, what Divine said uh, about the pre-existing conditions, but also how this, uh, how this uh, discourse is, works in our countries. Uh, so regarding to inequalities now and pandemic, for instance, we have uh, more uh, native people that are living worse than before because they have no access to the health systems. Uh, urban inequalities are getting worse. It is interesting to say that, for instance, the, the pandemic started in the richest part of the city and now the, there are more cases in the poorest part of the cities. 
uh, because of isolations, the, the measures of isolations are hard to, uh, to, 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 to establish uh, in, in different, in different um, houses and neighborhoods. For instance, is it not the same to be at home with, um, with uh, water, with space to, to be isolated, that to, than to live in slums uh, in one room, living five people with no water. So it is hard, this difference. Um, but also there are some paradox, and I will finish with that because I'm out of time. For instance, uh, in Buenos Aires, we were still in strong isolations while the, the other province of Argentina are getting out of this isolation because conditions are, uh, the 90% the, the, the of the cases are in Buenos Aires. So, um, and also, um, there are some, some way of understanding inequalities, not in these macro levels, but in the micro levels, in interactions, and for instance, how police treat uh, the people who do not, um, who do not respect the, the pandemic, the, the measures, for instance. It's not the same to not to uh, stay at home in slums, and maybe there are re repressive uh, measures to that people than uh, in the neighborhoods of the center of the city that are more allowed. Okay, I, I'm out of time, then we can continue discussing. Thank you. So inequity has come in many diverse shapes, sizes, and colors in Canada. And COVID-19 has released the genies of race, class, and gender from the bottle. As my colleague Charles Menzies tweeted last week, the color of the boardroom is capitalist. And the test of a government getting re-elected, it seems, is to manage that, that and to keep the public from getting too upset. The COVID-19 pandemic has released the harmony of illusions, as called, Alan Young has called um, other things. And SARS-CoV-2 is not really an equal opportunity pathogen. In the real world, COVID-19 is a Pandora's box of signs and symptoms of organ, organs and health and social system breakdowns, historical, political, and economic determinants that underlie the sickness manifested in this, this pandemic and the growth industries that are inevitably forming to capitalize on its futures are firmly rooted in precarious labor, system, systemic racism, and gender inequalities, ageism, ageism as much as they are accelerated by uh, global mobilities and global warming. Crowded wet markets, opportunistic zoonotic leaps, a pathogen can easily catch a flight to the next business meeting, another financial opportunity, the decision to leave borders open to save an imaginary financial economy that seems to be benefiting far fewer than the people laboring in it far fewer, um, it's benefiting far few, um, and, but the people laboring in it may, may, may not be seeing it very much. And that's gonna be subject for future critical analyses, I hope. The wealthy can afford care and they can replace their caregivers when they get sick. The privileged can work from home while collecting their wages and benefits. They can order in gourmet meals and do Zoom fitness workouts and they can garden and some even go for a swim in their backyard pool when the parks have been closed. Precarious workers, on the other hand, are often immigrant, the homeless, the institutionalized elderly, the immunocompromised, and those living with mental illnesses, not so much. SARS-CoV-2 is not really an equal opportunity pathogen. Those lacking education, employment, and good health for a multitude of structural circumstances also lack the economic buffers that have protected others. As of yesterday, um, over 102,000 Canadians have been diagnosed with coronavirus. Um, it, we are a population of about 38 million, um, almost two and a half million have been tested, and 3.8% of those have been found to be positive. Importantly, it's the institutionalized elderly that constitute the vast majority, fully 80% of the 8,500 deaths. These facilities have been knowingly underfunded for years, allowed um, various shades of privatization to creep in like wormwood rot. The board of directors of these facilities are made up of leading members of our society, some politicians and even former premiers, the most notorious collecting one, a quarter of a million in compensation a year for his volunteerism. The worst homes for the elderly crowded four seniors to a single room and left active cases in the same rooms as the least in, as, as the still uninfected. The Canadian army had to be called in to help residents lead, left and neglected in their own excrement and without food because the staff were too sick to come to work. 
precarious staff working part-time for minimum wage so management could avoid, let's face it, legally get away with paying their workers livable wages with benefits. With, uh, with benefits. So we've had this whole situation of often creeping in as, 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 as American companies, these long-term care facilities uh, for profit. These caregivers were shuttling between jobs in several facilities to afford to live for long-term care for the elderly to, from these long-term care for the elderly to sites of, of largely immigrant and migrant labor, first meatpacking plants, now farms. SARS-CoV-2 is no equal opportunity sickness in Canada. Essential workers became the mainstay of our society from those working in grocery stores to garbage pickup. Some healthcare workers, the medical professionals and unionized workers continue to be remunerated well. Others receive temporary top ups as frontline workers that was quickly, that is now quickly being clawed back um, as, as wave two comes to an end. Canada's colonial history through the present is ripe with systemic racism. Indigenous peoples comprise 5% of our population. Of our okay, until um, um, 1985, indigenous women lost their um, Indian status if they married a non-Indigenous man. Indigenous people have had the lowest rates of education, highest rates of food insecurity, diabetes, heart disease, tuberculosis, and respiratory illness in the country. Indigenous children are three or four. What I'm trying to sort of state here is, is that we have um, um, our, our, our own brands of inequities in Canada. Um, um, they've been addressed through various um, systems. Um, they're, they're being addressed by various um, in, um, national commissions like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for good or bad. Um, there's, there's very um, um, stated um, racial and ethnic um, vulnerabilities. Uh, the, the, um, there's been enormous collateral damage um, with COVID. Um, so people that aren't dying from COVID because um, our, our public health care system responds to everybody equally, and it really does, and this is the difference um, with our neighbors to the south. Um, um, they, 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 un underneath the wounds, underneath <clears throat> COVID-19, are all sorts of <clears throat> not necessarily reachable um, people. And, and in Vancouver's downtown east side, for example, um, there have been astronomically increase in, 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 in um, overdose deaths um, and in all of those, those interstices that, that creep in um, underneath uh, other forms of inequities. Um, our communities have felt um, less safe. Um, fully 60% of Chinese Canadians polled at the beginning of wave one um, have, have acknowledged adjusting their routines to avoid race, racist run-ins. And the extent, extent of intersectional inequities was evident when an Indigenous woman in Vancouver's east side, mistakenly identified as, as ethnically Asian, was beat up and told to go back to her own country. Racialization of those of apparent eth Asian ethnicity during the initial phase of the pandemic was palpable. Um, and it will, time will tell whether that continued as the epidemics as the waves move forward. Black lives mattered too in Canada, but just not the same, arriving at the in the 17th century as slaves to European settlers, and later as black loyalists. Um, black um, um, African Canadians made their way um, north to, to, to Nova Scotia, or African Americans made their way north to Nova Scotia um, during the American or after the American Revolution, it promised freedom and land. But as uh, my colleague Ingrid Waldron has shown, these free men and women were soon dispossessed of that land and indigenous and black communities have suffered systemic ra environmental racism in the ensuing centuries. In the first days of the provincial COVID lockdown here, our premier faced public backlash for singling out some African Nova, Nova Scotian communities as people who do not listen and won't stop partying. He said this two months ago. Prominent African Nova Scotians, such as Senator Wanda Thomas Bernard, were quick to respond with concern about the high rates of COVID-19 in their communities. We know that racism is a social determinant of health, but it's not identified as such, as such she said. It's not just in the suggestion that, we're fall, that, we, that we weren't following the public health guidelines around social physical distancing, but the tone that it was used, the language that was used, and the way that it was represented. Um, and so there was major pushback against this incredibly racist comment from our premier. 
Other groups organized and came together. Halifax is out of the cold emergency shelter in the Migla Native Friendship Center partnered with a downtown hotel in mid-March to house approximately 15 people experiencing homelessness during the um, beginnings of wave one. Such a move, and it's still cold here in March, really cold. So such a move afforded our, our citizens a safe, healthy and dignified living um, arrangement during the pandemic. Other shelters followed this model shortly after, funded primarily by federal dollars. And Canada's federal government stepped up with billions of dollars to support Canadians. Emergency response benefits, direct support programs for essential workers, students, seniors, the homeless and mentally ill. Deferred tax payments and a plethora of funds and credits were offered to businesses. Unprecedented millions were made available for COVID research and quick legislation was rolled out to assuage the, feels, the fears of inequitable access to emerging health technologies that are being funded. And to that end, the COVID-19 Emergency Response Act was prompt in, um, promptly enacted in March um, to appropriate any patented discovery therapy or vaccine as needed to address a public health emergency. So very different from countries where vaccine nationalism has been, has been put up on display as, as strength. Um, it was immediately um, topped um, and, and addressed by our government who said that any, any, any vaccines produced with Canadian monies should be made available um, um, based on, on need. Um, I think I'm probably running out of time and I can come back to this in, in the second round. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Janice, for your input. I will now, last but not least, we will finally go to our colleague from the Philippines, Mary Rosselli. Um, I'm, I haven't heard the discussion, but I'm sure we, you know, we can all agree that definitely inequality has been brought out very much by this COVID. It's, all, it's always been there. We've struggled against it for a long time, but now it's so obvious. And even the wealthy have to take a look at it because they were also affected since we know that the virus uh, goes throughout the society. Um, let me concentrate on the, the urban poor because that's really where I do most of my own research. And I work a lot with NGOs on the ground and the people's organizations. And one of the first things that I discovered when I, I called up my, the leader friends, most of the leaders are women in these urban informal settlements. So I called them up and asked, what's happening? How are you doing? And so on. So they began to tell me the stories of what's going on. And when, one thing very clear was the government had framed this, of course, as a health emergency. And they were mobilizing to deal with it that way. For the urban poor communities, the crisis, you know, this is another crisis. Every day is a crisis for them in a way. But this is another crisis. Uh, but what the crisis that faced them was the lockdown. They were not thinking at the beginning, at least, of the COVID, the, the pandemic itself. They heard about it. Many of them were dubious about it, just another form of flu. But what they did know and what they did frame as their issues was the lockdown and how it virtually stopped economic activity. And as I think probably our friend from India spoke or Argentina, uh, the, it meant that overnight they didn't have any time to prepare. And so those who earn every day on an everyday basis were really uh, stuck, shall we say, or in, in really bad shape and they framed the problem as hunger how am i going to feed my children so meanwhile while the government as as you know we have a somewhat authoritarian government they framed the problem as the security problem just as they did the drug problem this is a security problem you have to control the population so they don't wander off and spread this disease and therefore the interagency task force which was developed under the president is mainly, aside from department secretaries, a lot of military people, and almost all men, I think. Uh, and so they became the force which manages this whole process. Um, and for, so at the community level, even though we as anthropologists know how resilient, you know, how, how active people are, especially when they organize, and in the Philippines, in Manila, certainly, people's organizations are very strong and NGOs help in that organizing process. 
and they've made many demands, made successes here and there, anti-eviction and so on, better resources, but and adamantly staying in place. They're not moving. Uh, that's another whole saga. But uh, the organizing is strong. Uh, women very much at the head of these organizations, and they are quite willing to speak out. Women feel they have more uh, possibility of speaking out than males, especially when you have a militarized type of situation. Uh, and so for an anthropologist to see how the realities of communities, the struggles, the arguments between them, but also the vitality and kind of a shared value under an emergency situation, a shared value that Okay, we have to, I have to get my household uh, food allotments because government had to provide that. So they became totally dependent on government and on the well, um, you know, good feelings of better off people, church-based people and just NGOs and ordinary people who wanted to help knew that they were in dire circumstances. But, but the problem was, um, you know, from the community side, after they got their household's allocation, there were arguments about that. Often they would share it with their neighbors, with the people in their own sitios or their own, uh, certainly in their organizations, if not everybody got the same share. I mean, that value that you have to care about one another, which is always there, but it gets heightened when you have this kind of food short situation was there. And yet government basically, I, it's hard to draw, you know, not, anyway, government basically does not recognize or pay attention to or value the vitality of communities, which is a very sad thing to say. Um, okay, so there they were, just like in Argentina, locked in, in small places, uh, couldn't move out, uh, dependent now on government or uh, beneficial benefactors from the outside or NGOs who brought in uh, food and so on. The effects, of course, we you know, maybe you've all spoken already. I mean, children are out of school, and when poor children are out of school, the chances that they'll go back are much less than before, especially now if, if online becomes essential, uh, how are they going to ever catch up? I mean, government education is trying to do something about it, but we know that many of the children will not ever have access to the kinds of online equipment you need right, and the training you need. So education for children, which was really the, the family's way of moving up. You know, we did many, many chats with people in communities where um, the parents say, you know, my life is my life. We live in the city because we are trying to move up a little here and there, and they do. But if my children can at least finish high school, even college, then we're in good shape. Then my life, I can be satisfied because then the eldest will bring the younger uh, brothers and sisters to school, will take care of us in our old age. All of that is now going to be gone or at least very much undermined. So the poverty of the next generation is going to be facilitated uh, because of, of this uh, situation that they now all face. Food, of course, for nutrition, we can see that's sort of obvious, especially for children. So this lockdown has had very severe effects. The fact that um, as people begin to get anxious and try to go out in order to, to work somehow and get arrested because the police and the military are always around informal settlements, they see them as dangerous, then um, again, you can see the dynamic where um, urban poor communities, uh, you know, get less and less uh, what voice, uh, fewer and fewer voices or places where they can speak out without appearing to be criticizing the government. So let me just say that, all right, the strength of the communities, we hope, we, uh, we are trying to get across somehow that the terrible situation, we have very, we, we are not doing well huh, in the Philippines on incidents and cases and deaths and so on, compared to Thailand, our other Southeast Asian neighbors, compared to Vietnam, uh, which they, they got into this early on and they relied very much on a primary healthcare system that was working, which in our case has been, has sort of disappeared some years ago. So building up communities again would be one way, except if you have uh, an author a set of authorities who really don't uh, have much faith or trust in, in many of the poor, and the poor basically have lost, in many cases, trust in government. And we know that trust in governance is a basic feature for overcoming 
COVID uh, with the population. So I guess the last thing you know I would say there is um, the, ur the urban poor who are already poor, already many of them already in crisis situations, fluctuating up and down. Of course, that's reinforced, more dependent, different parts of the, the communities uh, diff affected, as we know, women, violence against women, uh, the military or uh, the police uh, report that the incidence of rape dropped by half compared to last year at the same time. But other groups that have studied this and by calling up people say, no, it's happened more, except that it's not reported now because the they at least have enough to do. They don't want to bother with, uh, you know, household problems. So all of that is, um, you know, coming out and uh, has to be seen. Poverty has been heightened. That's what we can say. And how long it will last, you know, whether it's heightened and extended long into the future. And so I guess, yeah, here's the final thing I want to say. Many of us who are in the you know, social sector, especially, are saying there have to, you need some, some kind of transformation of society, uh, less income disparity, but how do you do that? You know, as sociologists, anthropologists, psychologists, how do we do that? Uh, what are the specific things that can be done you know, so that you get really structural kinds of changes um, and one, one thing that often occurs to me, which I say to my middle and upper class friends is, you know, if you don't pay attention to the income disparities and the levels of poverty in this country, now COVID has shown it. There will be another pandemic for sure in whatever, 10, 20 years maybe, um, but uh, it'll affect you also and your children. So it is in your own interest, you better off people, to pay attention and you have power in government, uh, get to know people on a personal level, we can facilitate that, you know, those of us who work at grassroots level. So you see them as people, not as problems, which in many cases, of course, the outside sees them. So it requires a change in attitudes, in um, behavior, and in a concept of what is, what is a proper, what is a correct society, what is a fair society, what is an equitable society and that's where we are now so thank you from the beginning so i think that some of the themes or sub themes that have come up on the chat um are exactly some of the ones that have come up in previous seminars and previous webinars also the problem of domestic violence and gender inequalities the problem of course of socioeconomic levels and inequalities and also something that i i i I reckon it is quite important and uh, has been raised uh, well from people in the US, from Canada, also from Argentina and by Carmen in Brazil, which is the, the direct connection with government. Of course, of course, all the participants have been mentioning this, the problem, the, the question or the, the issue of the direct connection between uh, policies taken uh, to face this pandemia and the political options um, of each country. So I think uh, what we're seeing from, you know, hearing from all the speakers is that there's a kind of coming together or overlapping of three distinct kinds of inequalities. One is the existing long-term inequality, uh, you know, both in terms of work, in terms of gender relations, uh, in terms of uh, power uh, that has been, you know, that have been structurally underpinning the kinds of societies that we have. The second is the kind of inequality that has been created by COVID, uh, you know, in itself, uh, which we see manifested in terms of inequalities of state provision. So the inequalities that are created by differential infrastructure, differential access to nationalized health, uh, the way that different states have handled it, as well as the inequalities of, you know, age, for instance. So clearly, you know, comorbidities being a big issue for the elderly or uh, people who uh, you know are otherwise in uh, difficult living conditions uh, the third kind of inequality which we see very strongly both you know Mary talked about it in the Philippines and in India as well as in South Africa is the inequality created by the lockdown and that's been a huge um, ongoing crisis that we're going to see uh, in the next few years uh, playing out and I think what these three different types of inequalities bring together is uh, 
also an understanding of the kind of inequality that we have in um, imagination, in empathy, and in who has the right to feel. Because in a way, the fear of the middle classes or the elite about getting sick uh, is something that they can afford to fear. Whereas the poor who are also equally concerned about getting sick are not in a sense allowed to have this fear because they're so worried about starving. So there is a whole inequality in um, the kinds of emotions that people are taught to have, expected to have. Um, there's an inequality of resistance uh, because what we see with um, you know, countries like India, which have, ha which have authoritarian governments, is that rather than the pandemic providing a space for envisioning alternative futures, uh, thinking of uh, situations where you can have more local communities uh, growing things locally, you know, producing things locally, greater altruism. What we're seeing is a rise in authoritarianism, both data surveillance in the name of health management. So we have the Indian government pushing this app where they will, you know, record your location, record everything about you, um, among, you know, adding to existing data surveillance problems. Uh, you have extractive, um, you know, licenses being given for extractive industries in um, dense forest areas. You have a complete relaxation of labor laws. So there's been a kind of huge push towards uh, the more authoritarian aspects of governance, uh, apart from the criminalization of dissent. So even as you have COVID going on, more and more people are being put into jail uh, for, you know, all sorts of protests. Uh, that happened before COVID. Uh, so you have, on the one hand, people needing to think of alternatives because uh, of the situation that COVID has thrown up. And you have the government resorting to the same old extractive uh, anti-labor policies uh, and justifying it with the help of COVID. So I think we're going to see going ahead a kind of battle both of ideologies as well as the need to assert the right to have you know basic human dignity the right to have basic um, you know security uh, of health of conditions uh, regardless of uh, who you are so i think universal basic income is but it depends on how many people are going to be alive to fight these or how many people are going to be out of jail fighting these issues uh, in a country like India? There was a, a, one question to me, uh, to me uh, on the chart uh, that uh, it was mentioned a large scale uh, gathering. I mean, the military parade uh, yesterday, uh, the Red Square in Moscow. Actually, uh, the coming uh, uh, Sunday or weekend, uh, the 1st of July, there also will be an all-Union, all-Russia referendum on the constitutional amendment. And also there is a risk of uh, 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 more in, uh, people can g uh, get infection. But concerning the parade and also um, other uh, events uh, yesterday, including the state prices in, in science, which took place in Moscow, in Kremlin, and my friend Andrei Golovnyov, anthropologist, got this highest uh, prize uh, in science and technology. But he was two for two weeks ahead. He was asked to come here and to reside in a special resort place, completely isolated. And he was isolated for two weeks with all these veterans who were sitting uh, in, in this uh, 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 on the Red Square and who have communicated uh, with the President Putin and other officials. So, they, uh, so far I understand there were a lot of precautions uh, has been done and also a uh, testing. Uh, we tested 16 million people in the country and uh, that was one of the important uh, pecu uh, peculiar feature of the pandemic. Yes, there was a risk, but uh, the political will <laughs> of the government and of the president, I think, uh, was uh, present there. And a uh, certain risk, from my point of view, had place. And we will see, uh, I mean, a week later, how it affected. Uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why, in my presentation, I 
told that uh, transparency issue and my belief in statistic was uh, more or less reliable till the point uh, when the, this military parade uh, took place yesterday. It surely could influence political factor, could influence uh, the politics of transparency concerning the uh, coronavirus statistics. That was my answer to this question. And I also uh, want to say, when we discuss uh, the phenomenon of inequality, probably we should also mention not only uh, uh, unprivileged uh, uh, section of our society, but also people who privileged not only poor, but also rich. And uh, that's an interesting phenomenon concerning the extremely rich people in our country. I mentioned it's uh, less than 1%, and they had a, a unique chance to hide himself in some resort places, uh, which are carefully guarded, and also uh, collectively supplied. Uh, and it would be interesting to see how, what is the level of uh, the infection took place among the high-ranking people, because we know that even the head of our government, Mr. Mishustin, uh, got a, uh, a COVID and he got uh, he went through the uh, through this disease. But uh, that is how how the virus actually cross ethnic and social and racial borders. That is an also an interesting phenomenon. Can people with resources and with the, with rich uh, with the, uh, with with big money can really hide them from that uh, challenge or not. Mark Z uh, has been responding to the questions he posed, uh, which makes it even easier to respond to. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I should start by emphasizing what I indicated earlier, that uh, uh, pre-existing conditions the framework through which one should understand this virus and its consequences. Uh, because, I mean, uh, the way we are trying to deal with the virus and its consequences is to be able to mitigate, you know, people who are vulnerable or made vulnerable by these pre-existing uh, uh, conditions. And uh, for the case of South Africa, this is, this is really, really true. I mean, South Africa, uh, is a society that is unequal across racial lines. And a country uh, of close to 60 million and perhaps 61 million people, 75% uh, of that population, be it black, or, and 9% uh, or so of that population being, being white, uh, and then the rest, you know, uh, within the other uh, percentage, you know, you have uh, over 80% of the wealth in the hands of less than 10 or 10 percent or less and and, and you know you, you can see the consequences of this this is not just a, a, a south africa a specific to south africa we can see this in brazil we are seeing this in the us we are seeing this in france in many other countries you know we we are beginning to see that uh some of these issues that we thought were very exclusive about this space are issues that we can find uh globally and it's not surprising that you know uh, uh, right now to, to respond to Maxi's question that it, it is uh, black people who are most uh, affected and infected, you know. Uh, these uh, are spaces with intensity of relationships, uh, which one, a friend of mine, uh, Parfait Akana, has called uh, promiscuity, that in relationships are so intense, uh, conviviality is so intense, that the best way to describe it is to use the, the term promiscuous. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, all these uh, uh, measures, such as locking down, social distancing, uh, these are things that are very specific of a species. Every time I listen uh, uh, to the WHO present and tell, you know, when you're sick, you should, uh, uh, if you're living in a home, you should make sure that you choose a section of the home where you can isolate uh, someone, you know? Uh, and ensure that you stay away from this. I mean, how do you isolate, you know, when you live in two square meters or three square meters, you know, when you have uh, uh, lots of people living with that context? And as, as, she, as she remember has indicated least, lately, in many of these uh, contexts, like South Africa, like Cameroon, uh, lots of these ordinary people live through mobility across the city, through hawking, through selling, through trading. And when you 
uh, ask people to lock down, you know, you take away uh, some of uh, the basic means of survival, you know, for, for, for people, you know, within these uh, countries. Uh, and as someone had, had, had posed, when you compare uh, South Africa's uh, lockdown measures, you know, to that of many other countries on the continent, many others had to deal with this issue, you know, how do you lock down a country where intensity of relationships uh, you know, are very high, you know, where people are constantly connected, we, where these connections are the main, uh, main means of, of survival, uh, you know, in these uh, spaces. So the, I, we think the government, at least I think the government, the South African government has been really proactive, you know, in uh, uh, trying to mitigate the consequences of this. Of course, there's always more that should be done. Uh, and uh, in this country, we've seen civil society, you know, uh, show up. We've seen individuals, you know, make contributions. We, we I mean, we, we've seen lots and lots of uh, 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 collaborations or humanity or humaneness, you know, uh, uh, shown uh, to support and help uh, our people. But again, because we have pre-existing conditions, you know, uh, we structure living in this space and the virus. The virus has just exacerbated some of those. Uh, while uh, violence might have, uh, 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 crime might have dropped, but you, you see an increase in, uh, you know, gender-based violence. But it's not just South Africa. We see it in the U.S. We see people reporting, you know, across uh, uh, the world. So uh, while there are things that are specific about South Africa, I think it's important uh, uh, to connect those uh, uh, globally. And just to say one last thing, which... Uh, uh, I was reading Marx's uh, comment. I think there is um, uh, an assumption uh, about this continent that it's just incompetent. You know, every time there is a, a crisis, uh, this comp continent is always framed as a place that is inco uh, incompetent, you know. And if you look at what this continent has been able to do within the context of this virus, I think there is uh, something to be said about uh, the work uh, that uh, governments have uh, put in place given the meager resources that uh, they have uh, at their disposal. You know, for the Africa Center for Disease Control, for example, uh, has been able to connect many countries reporting at a time when many uh, uh, regional bodies and regional uh, collaborations have, have collapsed. Look at Europe, when Italy came to the doorsteps uh, of the European Union and others, you closed your borders. You know, we've seen leadership you know uh, uh on this continent and it is something you know to to acknowledge and this is not to deny the consequences you know and also the kind the the shortcomings that uh governments you know uh, are demonstrating lockdown so uh next speaker is mariano again mariano from uh, from argentina so i think he wants to um expand on this on this theme of poverty versus middle class. So please, Mariano, gracias. Uh, thank you. I was trying to write there and it was my turn also. And I have other questions also of Carmen, and I believe, that asked me about the perception of the president in, and president actions in Argentina. Let me try to organize this, uh, put my time, my speech, uh, now, regarding also to one question, Clara, you put for us is uh, the, what anthropologists can we learn, can we do, can uh, or must do about this? And first, I believe that we are, we should think what a pandemic is. So that's uh, for, because we are now thinking about this uh, question about Virginia put if the effects of the lockdown will be worse than the, the effects of the pandemic, as if these two things were not the same thing. Um, but I believe that are part of the same thing and we should go that way. Uh, here in Argentina, oh, but also make us to think about these different regimes of values, about what is worse and what should we defend. Here in Argentina, regarding to also to Carmen's question, the president, when we start, uh, this, uh, these actions that start quite, quite quickly here, as in South Africa, I, sorry, as in New Zealand, as I was reading, uh, because uh, we have only, let me think, that one, 100 cases when this started and only three dead. 
and we we got a, a, a completely locked down. Uh, we are isolated since then, three months ago, and we have 50,000 cases now and 100 dead, as I said. So my question here is, what is success? What, what does it mean that? Um, what regimes of values are we protecting now? Uh, the president of Argentina said here, if, when this starts from a recession, you come back, but you don't come back from debt. So that's uh, the, that start the discussion between, between economists and epidemi epidemiologists. And uh, well, that's, that's the thing that we as anthropologists must take care of thinking about these regimes of values that also goes, uh, goes with the idea of success. And I believe that um, the cases of uh, New Zealand and Argentina, why, why the same measure can work in one country and not in another, we have, we have a lot of, to do with that. Uh, so the perception of the president that Carmen in Argentina started like for the 80% of appro approval, now it's in 60% uh, because people are getting tired of being home and also because the economy is getting worse. Um, and as I, Nadine, I, I agree with Dan Nadini and Divine, Divine in, the, in, the, in the interventions about uh, how these people live and how difficult it is to live in different conditions. This, um, also because as Carmen put it out, uh, domestic violence and other kinds of violence against women are, are increasing now. Uh, so one measure that equals, uh, makes some, uh, ma ma make difference between different groups more equal are increasing other inequalities. That was my point, one of my points. The other point is to point out and talk about what Virginia said, if we are talking about poverty, uh, I don't believe that. I, I believe that it's even more complex because uh, we, we must start thinking about, that's my idea, about, about these regimes of value, uh, about what is worth living and what, uh, and that's, that's uh, important thinking about inequalities. What I'm trying to say is, for instance, when I try to put make my point about um, uh, people on the, in the interior and people on the city of Buenos Aires and how they live and how they put a uh, way of living as a legitimate way of living that we are we are playing on in all that stuff in which uh, values are more likely to be protected now um, so that goes also with my idea of that pandemic is not only one that is global but is local also and uh, we should start thinking about these effects and what well, divine or divine, I don't know how to say it, sorry, um, say that uh, it's root, <coughs> pandemic's root in local inequalities, but also in local legitimacy way of living that has to do with uh, inequalities. So I, I believe that the end of the road, biological life, it's, uh, it's important, it's the end of the life, but what happened in all this process that we are analyzing and maybe we should go that way and we should inter uh, we should um, intervene in the public debate in this uh, in this understanding is this way of understanding because uh, effects of the pandemics are rooted in local inequalities but also actions could be performed because uh, or in this in this way it's not the same as, as it was said that uh, we should be, we can be isolated at middle classes home, that in poorer houses, uh, it's not the same uh, people, for instance, in New Zealand say, well, why does it work there? It's only because ac government actions or because also people's perceptions of these uh, actions and what should we protect? That's interesting, I believe that we should discuss because here it has been a lot of protests against <coughs> government actions but these actions that use the virus are not only because of the virus but also because different political ideas that were before the the pandemic and now are re-expressed or expressed in another way interchange with this uh, um, with this new uh, situation. Well, I, I hope I 
uh, try to make my, my point a little more clear, I got out of time. Thank you. Um, I was sort of to sum up things going on here um, and put it in these th lines of equity. I would say that um, in terms of systems and institutions, our, um, Canada's public health care system and social safety net has in fact served many, many people quite well under the guidance of a civil society who has acted in the you know, interstices of the gaps. Um, any Canadian can seek public health care at no cost and newcomers without citizenship can do that, the poor can do that, the mentally ill can do that, um, anyone can be tested, but um, anyone and anyone would receive treatment or if there were any treatments um, and they, and, as well as care. So the work of finding the vulnerable though and the disenfranchised started immediately here. Canada isn't perfect and I pointed that out and I, um, but in many respects, uh, community is still valued and our healthcare system ensures that anyone who meets the medical criteria could be tested um, and, 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 and those are, that's taking place right now. And once counted, they, they're looked after as best as possible. Um, another thing that was really interesting to follow here and it, for me is um, the leadership and how science really trumps politics in Canada. Um, it was our scientists, our public health uh, officer, uh, Teresa Tam, and our provincial medical officers of health who told Canadians on a daily basis how their hospitals and public health system would serve them um, during the crisis um, and how they could seek emergency help in, in their communities when the hospitals were largely closed down. They were closed down, but people could still get medical attention um, um, either virtually or in, in, in little sort of standoff clinics. Um, the Prime Minister, whose wife uh, was among the first to be infected, self-isolated in front of the entire country. He self-isolated, but daily came out very transparently, walked out of his house, um, stood, you know, many feet away from the reporters and the, and the, and the cameras, and uh, reported the latest scientific um, and public health information that was going on. Um, and never want to miss a drama and a political opportunity. Um, he also used that as, as an opportunity to start rolling out money, lots and lots of money. Um, and every day he, um, he, he offered something to different, different groups. So in a way he captured the Canadian, Canadian population because they were wondering if they were gonna be in the next, in the next um, um, kind of like benefit package. Um, the, these these talks were science evidence based. Um, the public health approved statements were um, very clearly backed by the provincial and the the, the, the national um, um, medical officers of health. Um, public the public programs that were divvied out day after day in, involved wage relief and benefits that kept everybody interested. Um, care was taken to include um, all sorts of communities. Uh, the vulnerable, the homeless, researchers, um, and of course, lots and lots for businesses and banks. I mean, you know, this is a liberal government. The serial, uh, which, which here means they're not really, we aren't socialists, they aren't socialists. Many of us are, but they aren't. The serial routine drama made um, really excellent um, entertainment. I, I, it really, Canadians remain a skeptical lot. Few believe everything that comes from a politician's mouth, but our governments, both the federal and provincial governments, um, were clearly being advised by experts in public health. And when they got it wrong, people had the scientific literacy to understand that a new pathogen meant that there was, this was new information and no one could foresee the future. Um, not many Can Canadians believe in angels, but they do believe in peace, order, and good government. And I was really, that, that took me aback, actually. These are like kind of mum and apple pie statements, you know, of, of, of you know, sort of a, a colonial, post-colonial empire, but it really seemed to play out, um, um, though far from perfectly. And, and this is where the civil groups and social activists and all sorts of communities came in to fill in those gaps. Um, Few, few Canadians think their political leaders are, are infallible, and if they, if, they, if they piss them off, we, we vote them out. Um, at least that's worked so far. Uh, the miserable uh, environment, which is typical of urban slums, but the fact that people are you know, living there and trying to make a better life, 
Uh, you'll it'll show people doing their own, you know, uh, flood control of their own. They make those decisions and they decide. They raise funds for it. The women organize uh, ways of earning more income. So those are some of the pictures you'll see. Protests, which in this case this is a Catholic country by and large, uh, the protests are ca couched in the religious symbolism, right? Oh, this is, uh, here's, they, the kids get in on this, they're in on everything early. Just, just flash it very quickly. I do not want, need to discuss this. Can we just go through very fast? If that's too, if it's too much of a problem, you know, I'll just, you can just skip it and we'll, oh, here. Yeah, here's the, here's the environment, but the hope is that if this child can get through high school at least and college, that family has a future and so do the siblings, right? And that's kind of the main, the main avenue for uh, upward social mobility, if you want to call it, in the urban poor communities. Uh, again, examples here, they, they connect with NGOs who provide these materials, waste materials, and, and then they have technical people who teach them how to weave these things, and then they're sold in, in a kind of fancy market, so they make some profit. Um, you know, just by being organized, they work out ways in which they can improve their situation. Here's where they were fixing the um, flood control. And you can see the kids are always around. So the socialization from childhood uh, is, is there in those lives. And uh, what do these children aspire to? You know, mostly we see the boys want to be policemen, uh, big big car, truck drivers, the girls want to be nurses and teachers because those are the people they know. Uh, but meanwhile, if it's, and this is where NGOs have come in um, to help mobilize, you know, do organizing. Um, let's see, next. Yeah, so here again, the environment and what we have been, they have been saying for years is slum upgrading. You know, instead of throwing people out to resettle them out into distant places outside the city, which they have done, hundreds of thousands of families, on the reason, excuse or uh, rationale that they are on, you know, in flooded areas, which they've been for, for many, many years, they know how to deal with it, but when they get placed in actually houses with some uh, tenure security, they find they can't survive there because there are no jobs, they're too far out of the city, the transport is too um, high to come back in, et cetera. So very misplaced uh, projects, you know, in some cases. So let me, let me just get then, maybe we can just skip the rest of the slides and so I can concentrate that you asked, what, is, what, are, what, what can anthropologists do? One thing we can do, I think, is frame the problem from the perspectives of the people who have the problems. And those are the people we usually, as anthropologists, talk to uh, and so on. And when you work with NGOs that work with them, you really get into what, we, what some of us call engaged anthropology. That is, that you get committed to fostering their, especially information needs, and helping them formulate the issues in ways that they can put it into some kind of uh, proposal to the government as an alternative to what the government wants to do, say, vis-a-vis -vis housing, or, or how costly uh, all of that is. So we can, I think, be very supportive there. We're not activists in the sense that an NGO would be, because we are, we, we, we are evidence-based activists, and that's an important distinction, I think. To, be, uh, to keep our credibility I mean, if those of us who are based in universities, like I am, you have to do the standard things that anthropologists, they write in good journals, they give talks and, you know, this and that and conferences. You have to maintain your credibility as an anthropologist, which will enable you to do the kind of work supporting communities, and um, they call you an activist, but you, you show that your particular role is providing the kind of evidence that people decide they need. You know, not so much that we want to do research about them, but it's really a partnership uh, in an action, uh, pro uh, participatory action type process. And just to give you an example of um, this reframing, uh, not so long ago, a month ago or so, this interagency task force announced <clears throat> that uh, this COVID has shown that it's very difficult to deal with it because of the 
congestion in urban slums. All right, and to solve that, at least begin to solve it, people have to go back to the provinces that they came from, have to encourage them. They did say voluntarily, right? And uh, they know that they have to improve the situation in the rural areas to make them stay because in earlier program, they all came back. Uh, and, but, but that notion that the poor are to blame for the sustaining of this, uh, of this spread of this COVID, um, it, that was their framework, government framework, the organized urban communities together with NGO supporters and some of us academics brought out that congestion is exactly what they have been complaining about for years. So agreed, congestion is a big problem, but the answer is to improve housing, either on-site upgrading, tenure security, or uh, nearby relocation in the city with decent housing, which is affordable. And so there, the urban poor now have put together a manifesto in which they say, you know, the government is trying to get off the hook to deal with the realities of the needs of the urban poor by saying, one, they're the problem, two, therefore, they should go back to the province. Never mind, of course, the rural poor who are still there and how they will be affected. And the problem of, are you going to take COVID back to the province, which actually has been happening because they started this program although mainly they're trying to get back those who got stranded in Manila, go back home, the OF, overseas workers who have come back from the Middle East mostly, who have to get home. And they are now bringing, uh, even though they're supposed to be a, a, you know, examinations, testing, uh, doesn't always work. And they go back to the province and provinces which never had any COVID now are beginning to see it partly because of these entries. So, you know, the whole, so anthropologists, I think, have to come out and be very clear on what are the what are alternative frameworks for looking at the realities ahead, right? And just the last thing is, um, okay, what are some solutions? One of the things we're trying to work on is reallocate the budget, take another look at the budget of the government. Let's put less, you know, the Department of Public Highways has huge amounts of money to do what the, what's called the build, build, build program. Massive construction of bridges and roads, a lot of them in Metro Manila, some in the other cities, but heavy car supporting population systems, right? We have been criticizing that for a long time, but now we have the opportunity, we hope, through COVID to say, look, do you really need that compared to the need to provide, to really pay attention to universal health care, which was just passed in Congress? So if we're serious about universal health care, come on, let's really work on that system. It's the government program. So how about reallocating the money to uh, smaller hospitals, maybe in the city, or primary health care, community health workers, training, small scale um, health centers, and the like. So reallocating the budget, I think, is one place where we can also help together with our economist friends who are supportive of this. But I think we have to find our niches, and our niches are basically in evidence from the marginalized groups whose um, lives we try to assist. Okay, that's it.